Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome so much um, to our second next lecture of the year, as Jun has mentioned. Um, I'm the Juanita Irizarry, or Juanita Irizarry, whichever one you can pronounce, as I like to say, um, Executive Director of Friends of the Parks. Um, we are so excited that you're here. We had about 100 people RSVP, which is awesome. We are so excited for so much interest in this topic. Um, and we really look forward to spending the next hour, hour and a half, two hours with you. Um, usually our next lectures have been historically one hour back when we were in a room at the Chicago Cultural Center where we had a limited time frame. Um, uh, the virtual space makes it a little easier to go longer. And so we've been doing more like an hour and a half with Q&A um, these days. And sometimes we linger even more than that if there's great interest. And with a lot of folks uh, joining us today, maybe we will um, just hang out a little bit longer. Um, as mentioned, we will be recording this and make it available in follow-up. So we're really excited about that. Um, and we will um, you know, let you put questions in the chat as well as you know try to have some verbal Q&A moments as well. And so feel free throughout the presentation um, to put written chat, written questions in the chat um, if they come up for you um, during the presentation. So I'm just gonna say a few words and mostly not be in charge today, which I absolutely love because we have wonderful staff, wonderful presenters who will be managing the content today. Um, but you know we have historically, um, done these Netsch lectures honoring Walter Netsch, who used to be um, a uh, commissioner of the Park District, he's an architect who was well known, and whose family also um, left some support for Friends of the Parks in honor of his memory. And we are so thankful for that um, support and um, the memory of the good work that was done by Walter Netsch. And so in that, um, we love to create these spaces for some really interesting, and um, yeah, some interesting policy topics um, that are also often creative and artistic. And so today's um, lecture may combine that a little bit as we you know, think about um, our soft versus hard um, scapes at the lakefront and some modeling that has been done as part of the uh, North DuSable Lakeshore Drive Redefine the Drive project a project that, that Friends of the Parks has been a part of on task force um, kinds of roles over more than the time I've worked at Friends of the Parks, <laughs> which is eight years now. So it's been a long time that we've been at the table and we are excited to learn from what's happening at this project as we think also about other parts of the lakefront and the challenges with lakeshore erosion. And you'll hear more about that. Um, so just welcome. Thank you for being here today. And I'm going to hand things off to Jen Kilgore, our deputy director, who's also managing this work, and Danny McGee, our summer intern, both of whom will do all the magic um, to make sure that we have a great presentation. They will introduce um, our uh, presenters for today, and we will all learn a lot. So thanks, everybody, for being here. I am also, at some point soon, going to take myself off screen, which you may want to do if you don't want to appear on the recording, as has been noted. Thanks so much for being here. Thank you so much. And I just want to do the classic Zoom check-in. Is the PowerPoint showing up for you guys? Fantastic. Thank you so much. And thank you so much, Juanita. Um, one thing I notice, um, well, first of all, the you know, we talk about institutional history, we talk about Chicago history, and in terms of people who have uh, signed on or who are joining us. I know there are a lot of folks who've been involved for a long time, not just with Friends of the Parks, um, but with some of our key projects. So it's really exciting. I know there's a lot of rich history um, and expertise even in this room. Uh, so just a quick overview. You know, we've already had the welcome. We're here at the introductions and context. Our main presenters are Jennifer Hyman. She's the Director of Environmental and Design Services at Civil Tech Engineering and Roy Agnew. Um, landscape architect, Baird Engineering, and Rory, I apologize if I mispronounced your last name, but you will, of course, have an opportunity to introduce yourself again. Uh, we have Michael Falconing from Civil Tech Engineering, Edith Portales from Civil Tech, and then special shout out to Danny McGee and um, the University of Illinois at Chicago's 
Freshwater Lab. He is an intern with us and we've had a relationship with UIC for a couple of years and really exciting, um, again, to build those relationships, to take advantage of uh, the different expertises in, uh, in, our, in our region. Um, if you've joined in late, we are recording and I want to just anchor us in the broader context. I know Juanita spoke to this, um, but you know, our presenter is gonna be talking about a excuse me, a specific part of our lakefront within a specific project. But why are we here? What you know, what is our big focus? You know, we're focused on our shoreline damage that happens through wave action, whether it's the fluctuating levels of our lake or the more frequent, the more severe storms that we experience as a result of climate change. So that's the big picture, is how do we maintain this wonderful asset for our city? Um, opportunities, and these are not the only opportunities. You know, we, have, we had the opportunity with the redefine the drive. How can we use one project to get parkland and lakefront improvements? Um, the Army Corps of Engineers is in the middle of a, of a study of our lakefront to see what kind of treatments might they implement. And that's a big part of what we're doing. Uh, we're mobilizing, we're educating people so that we are ready to respond to the Army Corps of Engineers when they bring their proposal. You know, do we want to have walls? Do we want to have strong, you know, hard infrastructure? Do we want to have soft, you know, a soft edge with nature-based solutions that also increase our access to the lakefront? So those are some of the big questions that we're working within. Um, for those of you who are not as familiar with our work, some of our key projects are last four miles, and that's basically completing our network of parks and um, paths from the north side, all the way on the north side, to all the way on the south side. Um, again, of course, the redefine the drive is, is, is contained within the current, you know, with, within the limits of North South, you know, of Lakeshore Drive, South Lakeshore Drive, um, but we can learn from what's happening there and what's happening around the world to think about the entire lakefront. Um, we are also working on, you know, and actually currently suing the Army Corps of Engineers to prevent the expansion of the confined disposal facility that's right by Calumet Park. Um, also working on making DeSable Park happen. So those are just some of the projects that we're working on, you know, many others, but those are some of our, our key projects that are related to the lakefront. Our big, big context is our mission to inspire, equip, mobilize a diverse Chicago to ensure an equitable park system for a healthy Chicago. So that's our larger, larger context. And without further ado, we are not here to hear me talk. We are here to learn from the folks who are doing exciting work on Oak Street Beach and other places. So I'm gonna turn it over to our presenters. Thank you, Jen. This is Jen Hyman. I can share my screen if you'd like me to transfer. Sorry about that. All right, no problem. Uh, so I'll go ahead and get started. Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for having us here today. The North Tusabo Lakeshore Drive team is really excited to be presenting as part of this lecture series. And, you know, we appreciate and recognize the Shoreline work is really a unique component of a typical transportation and infrastructure project. Um, you know, we're happy to showcase this as a major objective for our study. Again, my name is Jennifer Hyman. I am one of our project managers from the consultant side of the North Dusava Lakeshore Drive team. I've been involved with the project as well from its beginning, and I'm excited to be here today with our teammate, um, Rory from Baird, who's leading the shoreline part, portion of our project. Rory, do you wanna give yourself a, a brief introduction as well? Sure. Thanks, Jen. Um, I'm Rory Agnew, so I'm a landscape architect with Baird and Associates. Um, we're based out of Madison, Wisconsin, but I've been working on this project since it started as well. Um, I currently serve as Baird's project manager and uh, kind of 
have my eye on all things shoreline related with respect to this study. Awesome, thanks, Rory. So I have a quick slide here just as an overview of our presentation. Um, we will have opportunities for Q&A after part one that's shown here and part two. Um, and then uh, to conclude the presentation, we'll share some of our uh, project renderings as well as contact information for the North DuSable Lakeshore Drive project as a whole. Again, um, for context, we are specifically focusing on the shoreline aspect of our North DuSable Lakeshore Drive project. We will have other opportunities upcoming later this year to discuss the overall study. And again, I'll provide that information at the end of this presentation for reference. So this is not something that's a surprise to this group at all. The city of Chicago and its relationship to Lake Michigan is an asset that most cities really could only dream of. And in its own right, North DuSable Lakeshore Drive is also an iconic and treasured feature located along the lake and within historic Lincoln Park. The drive and Lincoln Park together have evolved and expanded over decades since their origins. And within the North DuSable Lakeshore Drive project study limits, which extend between Grand Avenue and Hollywood Avenue, the drive is over 80 years old and in need of reconstruction. One of those major needs, particularly on the southern end of our project limits, is to address current infrastructure uh, deficiencies that lead to flooding and wave overtopping during storm events. As seen in the photos on the screen, flooding can lead to the closure of the lakefront trail for bicyclists and pedestrians, as well as closure of the drive itself. Wave overtopping results in considerable wear and tear on these facilities. And as you can see in uh, winter conditions, there's even ice buildup on the lakefront trail. Maintenance and repairs are often needed to these facilities as a result of these conditions. The North Tusabo Lakeshore Drive project aims to improve these infrastructure conditions and provide adequate shoreline protection measures to prevent any overtopping onto the drive in, future, in the future. These improvements are a major component of how the North Tusabo Lakeshore Drive project will build resilience to climate change adapt to fluctuating lake levels and accommodate re increased rainfall intensities. So it's kind of a, a broad painted picture of our North Tucson Lakeshore Drive study and its major goals. At this point, I'll hand it over to the main event and let Rory take over to talk about some shoreline aspects of the project. Thank you, Jen. I'm just gonna quick see if I can share my screen here. All right. Oh, sorry, I think I've got the wrong screen sharing. Are you guys seeing a presentation or notes? You've got notes. So you okay. Sorry. sorry about that. Worries. We appreciate it. And do feel free throughout the presentation to drop questions into the chat. Um, we have asked people to stay on mute until the end, um, but we will be watching the questions. So do feel free to participate in that way. All right, is that better? Uh, we don't see the presentation. I think it's maybe your second monitor. Hmm. Um. Yeah, let me do yeah, that. I apologize. No worries. We're getting there. So, uh, Jennifer, while we're working on the technical piece, which, you know, I was also a teacher, I've worn many hats. Um, <laughs> and I, when I was during the pandemic, I taught with one screen and I didn't learn how to use the double screens until afterwards. And I just do not know how I managed to make it without doing the double screen. So, but again, right. Once you do that, there's no going back. There is no going back. So, um, but they do present their complications. All right. This is looking good. We're good, Rory. Thanks. Thank you. I've got to do the typical Zoom though. You are on mute. So, 
We've hit uh, all so of the bingo card uh, slots. Yeah. Uh, for some reason, it booted me out, but it sounds like it's working now. You're good. So. good. You're great. Thanks, Rory. Much further ado, I'll jump into it. Um, yeah, again, I'm Rory Agnew. So I'm a landscape architect with Baird Associates. Uh, Baird, if you're not familiar with Baird, that makes sense. We're a small niche coastal engineering firm, um, but we, we do a lot of work all over the world, including Chicago's lakefront and I guess up and down the coast of the Great Lakes and Lake Michigan. So we're really familiar with this environment. And uh, the goal of the presentation here today is to show you kind of what we've done to, to get where we're at with the current designs for this reach of the drive. And also just kind of show you the designs, but give you some background in terms of the various tools that we use as engineers to get through all of the various challenges that the lakefront can throw at one. So with that, I'll jump right into it. Um, so a quick agenda, uh, shoreline design updates, and then I'm gonna jump into part one, which is gonna cover the numerical modeling. Um, so that's gonna be more desktop computer type approach that we looked at. And then after that, actually, we went into a physical model. So this is where we built up a portion of the shoreline in a wave basin. Um, a lot of really interesting stuff happened there and I'm excited to share that with everyone. And then just briefly touching on the next steps. Um, so I just wanted to throw in one slide in the beginning here to talk a little bit about uh, nature-based engineering. Uh, a lot of times it's referred as either green or kind of green to gray infrastructure. And you can see on the scale on the right there, uh, your green infrastructure would be more of your living shoreline type solutions. Uh, going down towards the kind of hardened coastal edges, which is I would refer to as the gray infrastructure. And I just know that this is kind of a balancing act because I guess as a landscape architect working along the coast, I really strive for pushing for a more eco-based design. But you, in reality, each site is unique and there's a lot of different challenges that you've got to look at when you're fighting the lake in a sense. I, well, I don't want to say fighting because you're not always fighting. You're trying to work with it and come up with resilient solutions. But a lot of times, the lake is a really powerful entity that can throw a lot of curveballs. So um, there's a certain time and place for each kind of different solution. And a lot of that comes down to the owner of the site and regulatory requirements, what you can and can't do. There's also like this project in particular, just uh, a plethora of stakeholders. So a lot of different opinions in terms of what wants, what can and what people want to see get done. Um, you also have to think about what kind of built infrastructure you're protecting. Um, say if it's a natural area and an open shoreline situation, yeah, you can look at all kinds of different stuff that might be able to erode and have more flexibility. Um, other places where you have buildings, built infrastructure that people have invested a lot of money in, a lot of times you do have to balance that out and look for more hardened solutions. Um, but the goal is to go through the process and come up with a balance and think about not just what those processes are that the lake throws at you today, but also looking ahead. And that's where you get into the climate change impacts and stuff like that. Um, there's, I guess, with respect to climate change in the Great Lakes, people often ask, what's that going to do to the water levels? Where is it going to be in 50 years? Um, a lot of unknowns there. So there's different climate models that people study that say one thing. Um, but there are some trends that people point to that say, you know, it could be warmer temperatures, less ice cover, more exposure to severe storms in the winter months without having ice or short fast ice to protect the shoreline. So there's just a lot of things to think about. But in general, what we try to do is create safe, functional, realistic, and resilient shorelines. And that's what we try to do for this stretch of shoreline as well. Um, just to give you a little background in terms of the area we're going to be looking at here. So the area of focus for this project, the entire redefined project is bigger than this, but the primary section that involves the coastal modifications extends from Ohio Street Beach. So kind of like right around Navy Pier, all the way to the north side of North Avenue Beach or the theater on the lake, if you're familiar with that. So in the video that you see in the upper right there, that's the storm that took place in 2014. It just shows kind of what happens when the lake levels can really, or I guess when storms can throw waves at the drive and cause overtopping and flooding and just, uh, it, it makes for dangerous situations. It makes for traffic congestion and 
uh, and can cause damage to existing infrastructure along the shoreline. So in terms of our goals and objectives here with the modifications that are being proposed to the drive itself, we want to try to aim to minimize that wave overtopping and shoreline induced flooding along the drive. Um, with that, we also, we don't want to just build a barrier, right? Um, so we want to look to expand and make adequate space for future park planning and just, uh, I guess, bringing public access to the lakefront. Um, another goal is that we don't want to reduce any of the current beach plan forms. So as opposed to that, we want to try to expand the beach plan forms. Um, and then water quality and aquatic ecology, those are always kind of in uh, involved with every design where you want to do what you can to make sure that you're not making things worse, but you're improving the area. Um, and particularly when you get into these urban settings, I think that's even more important because there's all kinds of relics from the past that have a lot of times not necessarily improved the aquatic habitat and just the overall water quality in these types of areas. Um, so just a couple of additional things we need to think about is just road and trailway configurations. So the designs that we proposed, we tried to make them flexible that they would work with any of the different uh, options that we're assessing for the drive itself. Um, we also think a lot about view sheds. So that's when you're standing along the urban edge and looking out. Um, again, we don't wanna try to create a visual barrier to the lake just cause that's such a huge asset for the city and all of its, everybody that visits the waterfront um, or looking in towards the city. So another thing, just regulatory, uh, anything that gets done on the lake, there's a lot of different regulatory hurdles to go through. So understanding those and planning for them ahead of time makes for an easier transition when you get closer to implementation. Um, I guess the big thing with that and constructability is we just want to look at realistic options right up front. Um, so I don't want to get too deep in any of these, but I just want to, you know, I mentioned that I've been working on this project since the beginning, which was started around 2013. So it's about 10 years now. Um, and we've kicked around all kinds of different concepts. So this is just kind of a, uh, something to show the magnitude of and scale of the different types of things we're looking at. So big beach expansions, um, shoreline improvements, submerged aquatic habitat, things of that nature. Um, so these are the two current concepts that we have right now in terms of the latest and greatest for the drive, or for this portion of the drive. Um, so when looking at the plan view on the top, we've really broken it into three different areas. So area one would be what we would say is south of the federal breakwater. So there's a breakwater structure that you may or may not be familiar with that protects the Chicago Harbor. Um, that offers a lot of shoreline protection for area one and just it, it affords some opportunities for what we can do back there. Um, and what we're currently proposing in both of these plans is actually similar to what you see in that perspective section image on the right, um, is a step revetment that's similar to say theater on the lake and uh, uh, like the diversity to Fullerton reach. So a lot of that has to do with the feedback we received from a lot of folks in terms of how they use this shoreline. Um, a lot of people swim here, triathletes and, and whatnot train, and they just, uh, a lot of the feedback we got was, it'd be nice to keep public access right along the shoreline in this protected area, as well as uh, allow for swimmers to keep using this as well. Um, when you go a little further north, so in these images, north is oriented to the right. You can see the, the north arrow by the scale bar in the top image. Um, the, there's two headland structures. So these, you can see my cursor, are these breakwater structures. I don't want to call them breakwaters. They're headlands or groin structures. They're really developed for beach reten retention. Um, in this particular option here, we've used them to not only retain sand to expand Oak, Oak Street Beach, but also provide a nice element for the public to get out and uh, experience the lakefront. Um, there's just so many people that use this lakeshore, um, having opportunities to get out and interact and view, uh, and look back towards the city. It just seems like a great opportunity to try to take advantage of that beach retention structure in such a nature or such a way. Um, they also, there's kind of two different green bands that you can see in these plans. The darker green that's along the shoreline here. This is what is the green space buffer that's noted in the sections on the right. 
So the idea there is that this, this is kind of a multi-purpose park space. Um, it's where trails go through. It's where you have open space, um, really just expanding public access to the shoreline. But it also serves as a place where um, overtopping waves could be collected and gathered and actually uh, drained back to the lake before they go over a secondary berm and flood the drive. So I'm going to get into a lot of those details once I start talking about the modeling, but I just want to give you guys a little context um, prior. So then on the bottom image, the main difference there between, I guess, area two would be that as opposed to um, taking advantage of, uh, well, I guess, sorry, let me jump back to the first one. So next to the Oak Street Beach here, it transitions back to somewhat of a step revetment situation, similar to what you'd see in area one. And that provides a similar type experience to what you have now, except for it's raised up and provides seating and ultimately is at an elevation that would protect the drive from wave-induced flooding and overtopping. Um, this particular area right here is one that's really prone to flood during extreme events currently. Um, area three is very similar in nature to what you see now for the Oak Street Beach. However, we've expanded beach, uh, the beach growing structures and pushed that out to expand the beach area itself. Um, it's not necessarily shown in this image here, but we're looking at different stuff for mitigation there and whether that would be putting reefs along the sills um, to help with beach retention as well as developing aquatic habitat along the along certain portions of the North Avenue Beach. Um, when you look at the plan on the bottom there, the biggest difference is in area two. So as opposed to just simply kind of maintaining and expanding Oak Street Beach, we've looked at how we can extend that all the way to North Avenue Beach. And the gray areas that you see in the water are actually submerged reef, submerged reef structures. Um, so uh, the advantage of using a reef structure like that is that they're not surface piercing in that they don't come through the water, or I guess they don't breach the water line. So they uh, have less disruption to views looking lakeward. Um, again, that was one of the main goals is try to minimize visual impacts, but they also, um, they're, they're great for aquatic habitat as well. So that's a feature we're exploring for that area. Um, just to give you kind of a bit of a design overview before I jump into all of the kind of technical modeling stuff is just uh, a bit of background on the type of wave conditions you see along shorelines like this and kind of shorelines in the Great Lakes in general. Um, a lot of the waves that you experience here are what we would call depth limited waves. That means that the wave height itself is directly correlates to the water depth. So in that's why when you see Lake Michigan go through its cyclical changes from highs to low, like you saw in say like the 2020, 2019, that era when lake levels were really high, um, that correlated to a lot of shoreline damage. And that a lot of that has to do with the fact that those wave heights that can impact the shoreline are tied directly to the water depth. Um, when you get into periods of lower lake levels, you see kind of the opposite where there's smaller waves hitting the shoreline, but that's not to say they're not doing damage as well. Um, a lot of times you can get lake bed down cutting from waves like that, and that can become a problem down the road as well because it scarps away glacial till and ultimately makes for uh, an opportunity for bigger waves to get to the shoreline during those more high lake level type of situations. Um, so, that's just one kind of brief note on, I guess, the wave environment. Through this study, we've done all kinds of different stuff with respect to our coastal analysis, and that involves doing lake bed surveys, um, putting out instrumentation to, to gather water level and wave uh, data, and as well as gathering all kinds of historic information with respect to water levels and waves. Um, there's a buoy at Calumet Harbor in Lake Michigan that a water level buoy that has been monitoring lake levels for the over, I think the past hundred years. So we've got about a hundred years of lake level data. Um, we use that to look at what is the return period of different lake levels in terms of extreme events. Um, and then there's, there's all kinds of different data that we look to for how we go through and assess the shoreline from a coastal perspective. Um, but that being said, the 
the idea here, as I mentioned earlier, was to look at how we can develop a solution that minimizes the height of the elevation we need for the crest along the shoreline, but also looks at how we can keep the drive from overtopping. So in the second image on the right there, you can see a schematic that just shows sort of how flooding and overtopping, it's a general schematic as to how we see it working for a step revetment type situation. Um, so that's keeping the revetment low enough that it does allow for some overtopping, but then putting a drainage swale, and this is kind of a large scale swale, green space, a multi-purpose area with trails and park, parkway and uh, the like, uh, and designing it such that that water can return and drain back to the lake. And it's very similar to what you see at like Diversity Fullerton and Theater on the Lake. And that image we have in the bottom right there is a, that's a two dimensional CFV model. And that's actually uh, looking at a extreme storm event and how the existing shoreline at Diversity Fullerton would function during that event. Um, so yeah, again, the, Kind of the big goal here with our modeling exercise was to look at these crest elevations and assess it by each reach and each type of shoreline, proposed shoreline type. And that's all linked back to the drive elevations. And it's gone through somewhat of a complex analysis where we've done a what we would call a multi-model approach. So we've used different, different models to look at all kinds of different stuff with respect to overtopping. Um, one of the first things we did was I mentioned there's there's hundreds of year, hundred years of water level data. Um, and then there's other different buoys on the lake that provide information with respect to wave data. Um, so we have about 40 years of both wave and water level data. And what we did through that was try to identify what were the worst case events along this street stretch of the shoreline and what caused flooding and damage and just closures to the roadway. So of the top 40 storms that we identified, there were four events that we could really recognize and identify that caused significant flooding and, and damage and closures to North Lake Shore or to the, to the drive. Um, the worst of which was on February 8th in 1987. So 1987 was kind of similar to what we had experienced in the last period of high lake levels where the, the water levels had peaked out and uh, February, so that was a winter storm, and that's typically when you get your bigger blows from the northeast, which those the the wave is really the or the the combination of water levels and waves are really what drive these significant storm events. So that being said, this is a this is a model we put together of the shoreline that mimics one of these northwesterly or sorry northeasterly events and with this we were able to look at how these waves propagate towards the shoreline and how they interact with these existing structures like the north avenue hook um, the federal breakwater which you see over on the left side of the image here and how they react along the shoreline so these are, this is a tool that we use as somewhat of an initial assessment just to start to understand how waves move through this area and how they'll be impacted and how the well, how our proposed design needs to react to this. So that shows both wave heights and then uh, the, I guess, the, the wave uh, pressure or, um, I guess, force in a sense. Um, so this is another numerical modeling tool that we used. After kind of looking at a, a bigger picture scale model, we drilled down into cross sections along the shoreline. Um, and sort of the purpose of this is a calibration exercise to look at do our numerical models uh, reproduce what we saw back during those extreme events. So this right here is a model that shows uh, the lake levels and storm conditions that we had in, during the February 8th, 1987 storm event. And really what we wanted to see here was how does this look along the shoreline? Are we getting water that hits up in here? So this is the, I guess, the northbound lane on the drive here. So this was a, a good first exercise just to run through and say, yes, what we've, what we've got set up really mimics what's happening. So 
with that, we jump into looking at some of our proposed solutions. So this is just an idea here. I shouldn't say just an idea. This is this is a an animation of uh, one of the initial concepts we looked at for the step revetment structure between Oak Street Beach and North Avenue Beach. Um, and for this one, you'll notice this rather large toe berm here. So this is like a 200 foot wide submerged stone berm. And the idea there was to look at reducing the lake bed elevation or the, the lake, the water depths and uh, understanding what kind of impact that would have on our wave conditions impacting the shoreline. So this particular model right here is the same storm event that we ran before. It doesn't show any overtopping. However, the crest elevations are really high and that submerged stone berm is pretty excessive. So it was a tool that we used to start to dial our design back away from, let's just say like such a gray piece of infrastructure and head more towards the green side of things. Um, this is another model we used. So beaches are kind of a whole nother element when it comes to looking at this in a, I guess, a numerical model sense. Uh, and that has to do with the fact that sand moves. Uh, sediment transport doesn't just stay put, uh, especially when you get these big storm events, beaches can reshape. So this model, while it's not as, I guess, visually appealing, it gives us a lot of good information because it takes into account uh, the erosion and deposition, more or less the profile changes that would happen along a beach during an extreme event. So all of these kind of initial tools were used to look at how we could dial in our crest elevations and just think about different means of designing infrastructure and protection along this stretch of North Lake Shore Drive to protect the drive and achieve the various goals. Um, with that, you it really comes down to uh, what we're looking for. Well, I should say it really comes down to, but one of the key things we're looking for is an overtopping volume. So that's the amount of water that comes over the crest of these proposed structures. And then we can, once we model those and dial that in, we can pump that volume of water through another 3D model, which is called Telemac. And this, this is a pretty interesting model in that it, uh, it, you can apply these flooding rates along here, and then it, it shows us how that's going to react within our drainage swale. So that helps us dial in uh, like openings in the structure for natural drainage back to the lake. Um, it tells us what how, how deep that overtopping water in our swale is going to get, and that helps inform the backshore berm. Um, it can give us velocities for that runoff, and then we can use a combination of analysis looking at depth and velocities to make sure that we're not creating a really unsafe area where water just gushes through here and it can wash people out to the lake, for example. Um, so a lot of tools to look at both the shoreline as well as the backshore area with respect to redesigning this reach of shoreline. Um, okay, so that's that's part one. I think we're going to open it up for questions now before I jump into part two. Thank you so much, Rory. That is, it's it's really interesting to to hear the sort of the technical side of the work that you do, especially trying to you know make predictions um, and be creative. Uh, so. I'm gonna, we've got some questions in the chat. Um, one of them is how confident are you that the historical lake level data act, so the, his, how, the historical data predicts future lake level fluctuations, given that many of the effects of climate change have not been yet realized? Um, so I'll, I'm gonna talk a little bit about that in part two. Um, with respect to the amount or the level of design we went to for this particular element, uh, there's certain criteria that say like the Army Corps typically publishes and, and uses as their, uh, I guess, design recommendations with respect to say like return period intervals for water levels. And if folks are wondering kind of what I mean by return period intervals and whatnot, so that's really the likelihood that a certain extreme elevation will be met on an annual basis. So say like a one in a hundred 
uh, one in a hundred year return period elevation would be a 1% chance every year that that could happen. So um, I guess with respect to your question, so Baird is actually working on a panel right now to study this. And there's, with respect to water levels, there is some, I guess, there's a lot of unknowns and uncertainties. Uh, so I really don't want to jump into what's going to happen with respect to water levels because, quite frankly, I don't know. But the the indications that we do see is that there could be um, potentially similar elevations in terms of peak highs and lows, but shorter periods in between those, or somewhat increased peaks and, and decreased lows. Um, but a lot of that it's it's a unique environment and it's not like sea level rise in terms of a climate change impact where the Great Lakes are just going to necessarily fill up and uh, we're always going to have higher lake levels because of climate change. Um, so that's just one thing. And, you know, it's not a tide driven environment. It's not similar to the oceans in terms of, I guess, what climate change could do. So I, I don't know if that helps answer your question, but I, I just, there is a lot of, I guess, uncertainties with respect to water levels. But that being said, we do try to take that into account and design for a higher uh, return period interval or like, a, I guess, a less likely event to be on the safer side. Hope for the best, plan for the worst. Uh, <laughs> In a sense, you know, like, it's, I mean, it sounds like you're, you know, assume you know you're not just limiting yourself to the you know the historical you know you're even if you don't know what's everything that's going to happen the educated guesses not guesses but the, the 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 analysis that you do is not limited to what we understand about the past is that fair to say yeah i mean what they're applying is regional climate models and stuff like that that do have a lot of predictions with respect to uh the element, the factors that do impact lake levels. So precipitation, uh, ice cover, um, different climatic factors that the Great Lakes, lakes Basin experiences um, and playing that into scenarios where they model water level changes and fluctuations. Um, so it's not that there isn't any knowledge about it, or I guess, but it, there's just a lot of, uh, I guess, uncertainty different climate models predict or different weather models predict different things with respect to the lake levels. So Rory, I'm going to ask you a logistics question because we have some great questions coming up in the chat and some of them are really, um, really meaty and hefty. And so can you give us a rough idea of how much more time you need for the rest of your presentation um, so that we can gauge um, the capacity for questions and answers. Um, Let's see. Um, and I'm not I, telling you to speed up. That's not the. Um, no, I'd say maybe if we if we went until like I guess another five to seven minutes to do questions and then continue on to part two, we'll have another kind of Q and A opportunity after that, um, and then a couple of minutes just to wrap up the presentation. That sounds, that sounds good. Um, so one question is, um, and you can, uh, if, um, if you can see the chat too, the, you know, how confident are you that the Army Corps is doing the best job possible about looking to the future in terms of climate change, given the failures of the revetments that have been created in the past? And one year, do you I'll just that? jump in since I'm the one who said this controversial thing and you may not want to answer it, but I mean, we've had conversations with people behind the scenes, elected officials who would not want to talk about this publicly, um, about their concerns that the Army Corps is not adequately forward looking um, and that we may need to push them to be more realistic about kind of the worst case scenarios possible around climate change. Um, so, you know, you may not be in a position to speak to that, but those are messages we've heard. Um, yeah, I think I'm going to pass on that question just because I, not, if it was a certain piece of shoreline, there might be certain things we could comment about, but I, in terms of a broad overarching comment, I, I just can't, mm -hmm. that, I guess. 
Yeah, and I guess, Rory, part of what you'll get to in the next section really is kind of that factor of safety that we've built into our designs to try and not make that a factor in a realization for the North to South Lakeshore Drive project. So, you know, we'll get to that uh, in part two. Yeah. You know, not just to put that in context, you know, we hear different stories about why the revetment at Northerly Island failed, you know, whether they didn't make adequate predictions or whether there wasn't a willingness to pay for what would have been required per more adequate predictions. But, you know, there are questions about whether there's a real understanding of where it's gonna go in the future. So that said, there were a couple of questions that are not from me. Um, so, you know, Jen or you folks can see the chat, please it doesn't have to be about me and staff questions. So here's a question. Um, how does the design anticipate possible use conflicts between swimmers and watercraft um, in this area? Yeah. And there's a question about further south, the promontory point. Point Again, I know that your work right now is, is focused on, on the Oak Street Beach area. Um, so can you speak to, and especially I'm curious about the, the reef, um, anticipating those different uses actually in the water? Yeah, um, so I guess I'll just first say that primarily we've been focusing on the technical side of things and not necessarily the uh, navigation issues, but we've done all kinds of projects around the Great Lakes where it goes to the point that um, you, you definitely have to start to think about that. Um, so there's a combination of things like uh, right now there is restrictions with respect to how close boaters can get to the seawall along they like the section between Ohio Street and Oak Street Beach. So there's different things that you can do in terms of uh, restricted navigation areas. Um, the reefs itself, while they're not surface piercing, they do create pretty shallow environments where um, not only are you worried about, say, boaters and, and pedestrian or swimmers and those kind of conflicts, but you're actually worried about, say, boats capsizing uh, just because there's not enough draft for a recreational craft to get through there anymore. So, you have to go through and work with the Coast Guard to put appropriate navigation structure or uh, uh, navigation aids on these structures and effectively have all those plans approved by the Coast Guard and uh, do things per regulations in that sense. But it is a because you do lose areas where boaters may have been able to pull through before, but it's now say like an aquatic habitat area or someplace that maybe a non-motorized -motor vehicle could take advantage of when the conditions are right. Thank you. Uh, sure. the, yeah, the only other thing I was gonna add is, you know, we, we do do some lengthy coordination with the Chicago Park District to understand those uses both in the water and on land. So that's uh, kind of how we've taken that into account so far in terms of where people are allowed to swim, where boaters are allowed to go. So that coordination continues for our project. So a couple more. Um, how does, you know, issues like E. coli, and I don't actually know how to pronounce this word, uh, uh, schiz schizosomes, um, it's, in the, it's in the chat. Um, how do your models, and you know, address water flow from that perspective? Yeah, so there's there's a lot of different things you can do with respect to models and particle tracking, just to look at currents and both existing and proposed conditions um, to see how those fluctuate under day-to-day -day conditions, extreme conditions, and well, to provide predictions with respect to um, what a designs, uh, what kind of impacts a design could have on those. And in general, we aim to try to improve areas. Um, but you have to, you, you go through and use the appropriate tools. Now, I, I say that we're not at that point yet with this design. We're looking at plan forms, um, but we haven't gone through and done actual water quality modeling yet. It's been primarily focused on uh, wave overtopping and shoreline protection. Um, does Oak Street Beach get bigger in the more conservative plan? Um, yes, Oak Street, it, it, I don't have the exact acreage, but it's uh, at least, I would say, three times as big as what Oak Street currently is. Yeah, I think in both concepts, <laughs> Oak Street Beach is longer than it is, or larger than it is today. And, and particularly during, 
periods of high lake levels too. I know Oak Street Beach can get can basically disappear almost completely during the, the extreme high periods. With the new designs, we have to keep a higher backshore elevation, which ultimately makes for more beach run. Um, and for those of you who are um, just joining, who, who weren't here at the beginning, we will be sharing this recording on our website. In addition to some more information, um, you know, that's part of our goal is to build out our, voc our vocabulary, our understandings about these issues so that we can spread the information to, you know, a diverse Chicago. So this is part of, you know, this isn't the only information, but this will be on our website. Um, this is an interesting question. Um, when we think about different agencies involved, you know, does the Army Corps have to be involved in this? Having been a part of the Save the Point campaign in the past, the Army Corps tends to do its own thing and often does not readily respond to public input without years and lots of energy put into the public through activism. I can take that one, Rory. So yes, the Army Corps will need to be involved ultimately for this project to become a reality. Um, we will be having to request a permit from them to do this work. Uh, we do coordinate with them uh, on the project. We have done that throughout the life of this study, and we will continue to do so as we, we get further along in the project process. Great. How are we doing, because we have some more questions, which we can also get to towards the end of the presentation. Um, and we're saving all these questions. Um, so how about we move into the rest of the presentation? We're monitoring the chat. So if you've asked a question and we haven't gotten to it, don't worry, we're not cutting you off. Um, but so having that balance, does that sound good, Roy? Uh, yeah, I think that makes sense. Uh, just I'll try not to get too long-winded through this next section. Thank you so much. Yeah, no problem. Um, okay, so the first part one was, as I mentioned, about numerical modeling. Now I want to jump into the physical modeling process that we went through for this section of shoreline. So the, the whole reach of shoreline from Ohio Street Beach to North Avenue Beach, I think is a little over two miles. So we couldn't fit that whole environment into a physical model. But we were able to scale it down to cover uh, about half of that area, so about a mile of lakeshore. And the area in the box on the bottom there, the orange box, is the area that we built up in a, in a wave basin in Ottawa, uh, Canada. So it was the NRC facility, which is run by the Canadian government. Um, the facility itself, just to give you some scale, uh, is 100 feet by 150 feet. And what we did was model both the existing conditions as well as the proposed conditions. And the proposed included both the two concepts that I had shown earlier. So the, the one that I'm calling the stepped revetment, as well as the other one that's the continuous beach concept. Um, so again, with the physical model, the we didn't look at all kinds of stuff like sediment transport, uh, water quality, circulation, stuff like that. It was really primarily focused on waves and overtopping. So the physical model process, when you, when you take a project, a coastal project, and go to a physical model, you, the first thing you do is you go through a planning and design process. Um, Baird is a Canadian company, so we have an office in Ottawa, and we do a lot of work at this NRC facility. And so we have staff there that work with them and go, and it's really hands-on uh, experience or process for us. And the first thing we do there is we, we give them the actual bathymetry of the near shore. So they go through and develop templates, fill those with gravel and pour concrete on top of that. So it's kind of like a, you know, it's a somewhat of a crude construction project in its own right. And then we go through this wave calibration process. And I, it's tough to see in this image here, and I'll be able to point out in, in the subsequent slides. But the uh, there's wave instrumentation in the water here that measures wave heights and water levels, um, their pressure trends, their pressure sensors more or less. And then there's also a bunch of different sensors on the back shore that collect water. And those are really looking at measuring the overtopping rates. So with this, we went through 
pretty in-depth uh, testing program where we looked at all different kinds of variables. So I talked a little bit about return period water levels. Um, so we looked at a whole range of extreme water levels from the 10 year return period all the way up to the 200 year return period. So the, I guess, with respect to a water level datum, and I'm not sure how familiar everybody is with those, but 7.1 is, is a really extreme water level for that 200 um, year water level. Uh, it's basically a record water level. Um, waves, so typical return periods there, we look from two to 100 years. So those are just more day-to-day -day conditions to extreme wave events. And then we were able to look at, we align the model such that um, the primary direction that we were looking at for wave angles came from the Northeast. So those are trying aiming to match those significant storm events that this reach of Chicago shoreline currently experiences. Um, and then we looked at all kinds of different variables with respect to the design. So that's different crest elevations. Um, you can see in this image here on the upper left, this is the stepped revetment structure and, and we built it out of wood so we could take steps away and look at and measure overtopping at different crest elevations or lowered crest elevations. Um, we put backshore walls in the beach and we adjusted the heights of those. We looked at different beach slopes, um, beach sills. So that's kind of what you see at North Avenue Beach now is a, is a sill or a steel sheet pile wall at the toe of the beach or near the toe. And we also looked at submerged stone elements as well. But again, the goal with this was to define like well, define the overtopping and the proposed crest elevations. So these are just some model or some images of the construction of the existing con conditions. Um, what you see here is the construction of the North Avenue hook here. Um, the drive itself is the, the gray paint in the back here. It's kind of tough to orient yourself without any water in the basin, but it just kind of shows you the whole process and the scale of the model. Um, this is a video of uh, testing conditions for the existing conditions test. And the idea here was to mimic a storm event that caused overtopping on the drive. And in this particular one here, we were mimicking the 2014 storm event. And the goal, this is all part of a calibration exercise to ensure that the existing conditions are reacting as, per, as they currently do during similar water level and and storm conditions. But the, uh, let's replay this quick. So these, what you see in the back here, these are devices that measure overtopping. And what we're really looking to do is get a volume of overtopping per lineal foot. And then we can plug that into models and understand uh, how that relates to water levels and wave action and uh, essentially flooding and damage as well. Um, so after we completed the existing conditions tests, we built up the proposed conditions for concept one. Um, so in doing this, we were able to look at a lot of different stuff, and that includes different beach slopes through Oak Street Beach area. So we went with a more gradual slope of one to 30. Um, we did that slope with a sill. So that's the middle area here, and you can see it's cut off with a vertical wall that's submerged underwater. And we looked at a one to 15 slope, so a steeper slope if it was more of a uh, heavier grain sand or a cobble. And the, the, the overtopping catchments were designed such that we can get information on those slopes and have, I guess, multiple um, designs being run at the same time in that beach area. Um, this is an overview of that concept one model. So just to give you an idea of the scale, so you can see the, the gray in the upper right image is the existing drive. Um, the new drive alignment isn't shown, but this is the new edge of the shoreline. So it just gives you an idea of the kind of the order of magnitude here in terms of how far out and how much park space that this type of solution could develop. Um, and then this is just a video to show you kind of how those different beach slopes react, the waves. Um, you have your more gradual slopes towards the end of the beach here. And you can kind of see it here that the video stopped now, but the wave action, it, it attenuates that wave further away from the shoreline, whereas your steeper slopes tend to allow more overtopping and breaking waves to get closer to the back shore of the beach area there. So 
all in all, just a lot of really good data points for us to collect in terms of looking at how to dial in these concepts and, and ultimately unique things that we can do down the road. Um, so that concept one is more of your harder, hardened kind of grayer infrastructure. And uh, I guess concept two gets more into the, the green side of things with looking at this beach with a large, uh, I guess, expansive beach area, but a submerged stone reef structure that uh, sits adjacent to that beach and provides the actual stability for that as well as attenuates waves prior to hitting that beach area. Um, so this is an overview of the model for the concept two, the continuous beach option. So we looked at a lot of different variables inside of this beach area as well. Um, everything from different beach slopes to different widths on uh, submerged stone berms to mimic these reef structures. Um, so really, again, we aligned all this with the catchment data or catchment basins so we can collect data on how those react at different water levels in terms of overtopping. Um, one thing to note is that we built the beach out of concrete in a physical model environment like this. Say if you were going to model a revetment or a breakwater with stone, you can scale that down. But when you do get to do, do a beach situation, especially at a one to 50 scale model, you just can't scale down sand. And you do sand for something like this and over steepen the profile and throw the data off. So that's that's why we built concrete beaches. And that's why I mentioned that this model was purely about looking at overtopping and, and waves as opposed to beach stability or circulation and water quality. It just allowed us to look at a lot of different stuff through one particular reach of shoreline. This is uh, this is a video showing a uh, test along the continuous beach area. Um, you can see these are the wave probe measurements. Um, it's all kind of crude looking equipment, but these are the kind of the whole key to this process is the data that we do get from this, this instrumentation. And uh, as I mentioned, the data. So what following this, testing in the physical model environment, we were, we, you get all kinds of data. Um, and the first, so there's hundreds, 100 plus simulations. Um, so that's looking at all different water levels, different wave angles, different scenarios, um, a combination of different type of protection structures, and those were adjusted. So just a wealth of different things were tested through this whole area, in this with this model, I should say. And uh, so what we do when we get that data is we start to sort through it and look for trends and pick things out. So this is just an example of a few different things we can look at. So we can pick up beach slopes and see how those react. We can look at mean wave directions. So that's looking at your different angle of wave coming from the Northeast. Um, you can look at different period waves. So that's the length of the wave and the intensity. Um, you, we were able to dial in and look at the effectiveness of submerged berms and their width and the elevations. Um, but let me just point out a few things on these graphs because it's kind of interesting in terms of how we use this data to develop our crest elevations. Um, so on the right hand side here, you have the mean overtopping. So this is the amount of water that goes over there. And there's a gray line and a back, black line. So these are published thresholds with respect to overtopping and what it can do for damage to the backshore. Um, the black line overtopping after, over that threshold is known to cause, excuse me, damage to concrete structures and hardscape. Whereas, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, the, the gray line is a reduced volume of overtopping and that is, <coughs> pardon me, excuse me, um, that looks at more damage to soft scape structures. So the intention here is to look at this and see what is the, <clears throat> excuse me, I apologize, I'm talking for an hour straight. <laughs> um, the, the intention here is to look at trends and see sort of what is the <clears throat> equal, <clears throat> the defining factor or freeboard is what we call it here in terms of uh, looking at how to, how to pick out overtopping trends. And so I'm getting into a lot of technical stuff here, but freeboard is basically the difference between the crest elevation and the water level. 
And as that freeboard reduces, um, the amount of overtopping goes up. So we use this data to pick out uh, trends and also to develop uh, exponential curves and equations that can define uh, crust elevations and overtopping for certain structure types. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, so to kind of bring it all home here. So the, the two charts on the top there, those are the results of our physical model and how we interpreted those results. And basically there's a couple, there's a couple key parameters there. So we look at the water level, so that's the first column, and well, the first two columns are the water level. One is the return period, and the second is the elevation. So we've designed these for the 200-year return period, and that kind of goes back to the climate change discussion. Um, the core's old publications and recommendations would say like a 2010 or a 1020, so that's a combination of the water level and the, the, the wave condition. So basically a 10-year water level and a 20-year wave or a 20-year water level and 10-year wave, where we're looking at the 200-year water level and really um, the worst case scenarios through that. So, and it all ties back to the lake bed elevation. So that's, and the lake bed elevation as well as the overtopping limit. So we define the overtopping limit, we plug in the lake bed elevation along the shoreline, and then from this data, the physical model, it can is the equations that we put together can calculate a crest elevation. So yeah, all very technical, but all very necessary to define the shoreline protection along a stretch of shoreline like this. Um, and a couple key things here in terms of kind of bringing it back to nature base versus that hardened infrastructure is just the benefit that you can get from a beach in, a, in an urban area like this. Um, so you can, these numbers here, the 10.3, the 12.1, the 10.3, those are all the backshore elevations required to limit the amount of overtopping into this flooding and drainage area. So if I switch over to uh, this beach concept, the, the, you're able to reduce your backshore crest elevation by a couple feet, which might not seem like a lot, but when you're looking along the urban edge and it all ties back to these elevations, it actually does quite a bit for preserving views towards the lake. It reduces the amount of lake fill that you need pretty significantly just based on a couple feet of elevation. Um, and with the, the concept here with the submerged reef structure, um, yes, that does have some navigation impacts, you're, but it also provides a lot of aquatic habitat benefits and creates um, somewhat of a iconic I don't know if iconic is the right word, but an ecological based solution in the heart of an urban kind of shoreline here on Lake Michigan, which I think has a lot in, in line with what your guys' ideology is in terms of the friends with the parks and uh, just looking for nature based solutions. So, with that, I guess I have one last slide just in terms of where we're headed next with this. So, we take this physical model data and we actually use this to calibrate more sophisticated computer models. And so this is a reef structure looking at, uh, I guess it's a, a modeled reef structure where we're looking at taking data from a physical model and using that to calibrate our, our computer model. And it can provide a lot of really interesting animations and stuff like this, but really there's, there's a lot of data that we're pulling from these models as well. We kind of start to see this in these in this animation here where we get velocities and just different characteristics of, of the wave as they break across these reefs. And uh, I guess in the bottom right hand image there, I just want to point out a project in Toronto that we designed that used a similar type uh, design for a public beach in a similar urban type setting. Um, so that is everything I have today in terms of talking about this stretch of shoreline. I really appreciate everybody that joined the call. I, I know it's a, you know, it's the middle of the day. It's kind of tough to time all this stuff. And uh, I just, to see a hundred people on the call to hear about this stretch of shoreline, it's just really impressive. And I'm uh, happy to be able to do this. So thank you.
Thank you so much, Roy and Jennifer. Um, we will keep this room open past 1.30 for those who can stick around and who are interested in stick around. Um, we will get to the questions that have been asked in the chat. We might not get to all of them, but that's why we have opportunities for follow-up. I'm gonna start us off for questions actually with Juanita. Thanks, I'm gonna take executive director privilege, but there was an answer that I provided to someone in the chat about how, you know, we definitely as friends of the parks, you know, hope that this information inspires thought and planning about the application of these concepts elsewhere along the lake, including the far north and far section, far south sections, um, where we have our last four miles vision. But I wanted to ask a question that you might know the answer to technically, maybe Jennifer does, not that it's your place to advocate about this stuff, but just technically, what I did not answer in the chat is, I mean, you guys are doing this in relation to protecting a federal asset uh, road, right? But it would not be your role to do this or the Chicago Park District's role to bring these types of solutions to private property. So this is only the, the science behind it is applicable, but in terms of like federal dollars that may come down to do this work, it would not be applied to portions where it's private homes that need to be protected. Is that correct to your knowledge? I, I can kind of speak to that. So the work that we're doing for the North to Savile Lakeshore Drive project is uh, largely an environmental study to be eligible for federal dollars. Um, that will come from a variety of different sources, whether that's federal highways for the roadway and infrastructure work, or whether that's Army Corps for shoreline, etc. Um, you know, that's all that's all really the main objective of why we're undertaking this study in the first place. So that has to abide by all of the federal laws and federal requirements. Um, and in large part, what we're doing is completing that study to be eligible for those funds. Part of what happen, needs to happen down the line still is to identify and secure those funds for the project. So that's still something that has yet to be done, um, but it's all part of the you know, forward thinking of where we're going for the project. To your knowledge, in terms of federal law, can folks apply for like federal dollars to do this kind of work for private property? I am not aware of that. I wouldn't be the one to answer. So. Okay. Just wanted to make sure, sure that I didn't leave it out there that we necessarily think that anybody's trying to apply these kinds of principles on private land at this moment, or, or as it relates to areas where private, people have their own repairing rights to land. Understood. Okay, thanks. Sure. Jen, did you want to read others from the chat? I, and I and I do have one question as well. Um, and you might have mentioned this, uh, but can you speak to how this affects the lakefront trail? Because I may have misinterpreted one of the question, one of the images, because it looked like the overflow was sort of planned to. Um, but the trail is part of that in a way like nature-based solutions. So can you just speak to that? Sure, I think Rory, uh, I know that in some of our concepts, uh, the Lakefront Trail does appear there in the section. Do you wanna to speak to that part of it? Um, yeah. <clears throat> so in terms of how the Lakefront Trail integrates into the backshore uh, green space buffer, it's, it's intended that that area is a multi-use area and the trailway takes advantage of it in terms of uh, going to on, both on the berm as well as inside of the uh, the drainage swale itself. And I think I, it's kind of tough to, well, actually, Jen, do you, do you think this is a good time to show a couple of renderings just to give people an idea? Yeah, we can definitely share renderings. Um, and then I do know we have, uh, Dave Miller from the Chicago Department of Transportation, who can also kind of speak to the uh, lakefront trail improvements that are incorporated as part of our study. Dave, did you want to speak to those? Yeah, sure. I mean, so we know that the lakefront trail for those walking or biking or otherwise not using a car is a critical transportation corridor along the lakefront, right? So the intent is to protect it 
in a way that it's not protected right now. Like right now at the Oak Street Curve, where it doesn't take that big of a storm or that high of wave levels to inundate the trail and make it impassable if you're if you're walking or biking on it. So the intent is to, to set it back further from the shoreline, provide a level of protection so we don't see flooding like we do today. So it can be a more usable facility all the time. Yeah, and that's where I had mentioned the renderings. I think those would do a good job of depicting that. It's not like a big ditch that we're designing. It's a multi-use yeah, the park space with trailways of different types going through there. So a really interactive waterfront. Yeah, and I can share those. Um, I do need permission to share at this point. I know Jen or Danny, if you can allow that. We see if that works now. Yes, that works. Excellent. Yeah, so we have some really great um, renderings of what this project could potentially look like, you know, particularly the shoreline aspect uh, of this project. So on the next few slides, I can share a few of those that we've developed for the study. Um, this view is of the Oak Street Beach looking south towards Navy Pier and the city skyline. Uh, as you can see, there's little sand area at the Oak Street Beach. You know, Rory had mentioned at times when there's high lake levels, it can almost disappear. Um, and then you can also see that Lakeshore Drive, DuSable Lakeshore Drive is only really protected and the lakefront trail for that matter is directly adjacent to a uh, step revetment wall there. That's really the only thing preventing or not preventing in this case wave overtopping. So here is a potential future view of proposed conditions. The shoreline and park space is substantially expanded. Um, with over 80 acres of added park space and an extent, expanded Oak Street Beach. These added park space areas are largely a resultant of what's needed for uh, North Tusabo Lakeshore Drive improvements and those shoreline protection measures to prevent that wave overtopping. Um, I know specifically we brought these up for the Lakefront Trail. You can also see here in the expanded park spaces that we are still continuing to provide separated facilities for those who walk and bike within Lincoln Park. And we are um, proposing to add new uh, access points for those who walk and bike and those who would like to uh, get to link Lin get to Lincoln Park as it's a little bit more challenging, particularly in this area of the project. Here we have a, a view looking towards Chicago Avenue, where again today, North Tusabo Lake Shore Drive is only separated from Lake Michigan by a narrow concrete revetment wall. Uh, this revetment wall, as many of you I'm sure are familiar, also doubles as the lakefront trail as it's essentially striped with on top of that revetment wall and can often be closed during storm events. Here is a potential future view of proposed conditions that show the expanded wall shifted to the east to accommodate North Tusabo Lakeshore Drive improvements and in expanded park spaces. And in this condition, you can see that the lakefront trail is physically separated from that concrete uh, revetment wall as its own facility. Uh, we have one more view here. Uh, the existing conditions view here is at the Oak Street Curve uh, looking north. Again, you can see it doesn't take very much for water to uh, come on top of that revetment wall and over top um, the, onto the lakefront trail. In this future view, the expanded shoreline to protect the drive and provide additional park space does allow us for improved access points, new plantings, continuation of those separated facilities for those who walk through Lincoln Park, um, those who walk and bike through Lincoln Park using the Lakefront Trail. And I will too kind of put this info out here, um, really kind of to before going to address any of the other questions, this is the only final slide that I have. Uh, there are some opportunities that we'll have for the North Tusabo Lakeshore Drive project to uh, engage with others this fall, um, but you can do so at any time if you would like. You can contact the project team via email. Our email address is info at ndlsd.org. Uh, you can also visit our website, northtusabolakeshoredrive.org. And uh, recently, earlier this year, we had actually put together a shoreline protection video that kind of gives an overview of all the information that Rory presented here today. It's a it's kind of an abridged version in a three minute video. Um, we, can, we can put this in the chat as well. It's also available on our project website if anyone wants to review that. 
Thank you. Uh, okay, so again, and I, I forget from the from our presenters, if any of you are able to stick around a little longer, that would be amazing, but completely understand if that is not possible. In terms of the questions, I just want to share a couple of themes that I'm hearing. Um, questions about what does this mean for other parts of the lakefront? You know, so, you know, we're talking about the north side, but there's also the south side. Um, there are more questions about, again, how, how do we work with the Army Corps of Engineers around these issues? Um, which again, that is a huge piece of the work that Friends of the Parks is doing right now. Um, questions about maintenance and um, also budget. So if you can speak to um, any of those questions, you know, it's the, for folks who are, who are wondering like, where are outs on the lakefront? Can you speak to that? Sure. I mean, I would like to say too, I'd encourage you to send some of the like more broad questions about the project in general to us, uh, either via email. Um, we have a ton of information available on our website. You know, I, I we did want to keep this conversation kind of strictly to the shoreline protection measures and, and that front of the study. Um, so I think if we try to tackle some of those in the chat, I mean, particularly with the, the time that we have remaining, um, I'm still kind of reading through them. I'm not sure if there's one particularly you wanted to start with, uh, Jen, and kind of toss our way on the shoreline protection measures front. Mm -hmm. Can I throw in mine again? I'm sorry, I, I'm taking up some space, but just based on what I'm reading and my questions. You know, we've also spent some time looking at like taking walks at places like the Montrose Natural Area and trying to understand the value of the same habitat that's so great for Monty and Rose. What does that mean for lakeshore erosion, right? And mitigation of that. And how do, you know, have you done any study of parks and beaches that look like your pictures and north? Avenue and Oak Street Beach versus beaches that look like Montrose or some of what is developing, I say, at Rainbow Beach and, and the nearby Park 566 that are more natural areas. Like, just can you speak to the differences in the value um, in terms of mitigating lakeshore erosion, if there are? Yeah, Rory, I don't know if you have any kind of experience to speak to on those different different beach types and areas. Yeah, are you just saying, have we looked at all kinds of different precedents and if there's anything else that we've thought or considered and maybe, so yeah, I mean, in, so with the physical model and stuff like that, so all the different beach shapes and everything that we looked at, a lot of that had to do with looking at different types of beach opportunities. Like if a lot of places use cobble beaches and stuff like that because they're more stable. So say like that Northern cell on North Avenue beach that seems to disappear lately. We've looked at could that be a cobble beach? Would that make sense? Um, there's different opportunities that you can do if your beach is more stable and doesn't fluctuate as much. So yeah, I mean, in terms of drawing on other places as like I guess precedence and just experience, um, that somewhat happens inherently. Um, the Gibraltar Point one that I mentioned was one that I've kind of used as a precedent for a lot of the submerged reef. Uh, so yeah, I encourage you to check that out or like TRCA in general. It's the Toronto Regional Conservation Authority. They have a lot of really good examples of stuff they've done. Um, they have a little bit of a different regulatory environment, so they have different approaches that they take to their shoreline as well. But a lot of it, it has to do with being, some areas are more rural, some areas are urban. Um, not to say that like Illinois is not doing the best job that they can or anything like that in comparison to Canada, for example. But I, that's just an area that I look to for precedent sometimes. Can you say something about that different regulatory environment? Can you say a little bit more about what that means? Um, like they, just, there are things that are allowed there that are not allowed here. Um, yeah, so I don't know if it's necessarily things that aren't allowed, but it's a whole different process being two different countries in terms of how you permit. Um, you know, there's laws that are in place here with respect to um, lake bed trust and just the public trust and the and who owns the lake bed what you can do and the volume of fill um different things like that um they have similar rules in canada but it's it's kind of a whole different not that they let you do more or anything like that i but it is a different uh process thanks mm -hmm. 
So, uh, Jennifer, I appreciate it. You said, I know you were checking the questions in the chat. Are you up for, or actually, I do want to give a, because uh, I asked a specific person, I can't remember who it was, if they'd be willing to um, speak to. If Is Heather still here? If you wanted to share your question, I can't tell if she's Yes, here. I'm still here. And thank you. Um, okay, if I do it over the mic? Yes, exactly. Yeah. Thank okay. You. All right. So I'm with Advocates for Morgan Scholl. It's the it was to be the fourth reach that was to be addressed under the 94 Shoreline Protection Plan, but the funds were utilized and finished at the end of the Fullerton project. So the city is now putting Morgan Scholl that reach back on the table. And the budget has recently jumped from 30 to 50 million to almost 200 million. So it, it makes me, and we can't seem to get information specific. So I am wondering sort of the relationship between this sort of planning. Um, I believe the Public Building Commission is still responsible for overseeing this particular reach at Morgan Scholl. I just, um, that's my question. I am curious how all these pieces fit together and when and where the community enters. Sure, you know, I think it's it's largely a question of funding and making sure that there's enough budget to actually make these projects become reality, right? I, I did note that part of the main objective for this project is making sure that we're eligible for some of those sources. I mean, the it's it's a very hefty dollar amount to make something like this a reality right so there we are making ourselves eligible for those different funding sources that are out there but identifying exactly what those are how much you're able to obtain and you know kind of the mix and match of the different funding sources is still something we need to do as part of the north disable lakeshore drive project i i can't really speak to other projects in terms of you know morgan shoal or other shoreline projects Um, yeah, I think that's a little bit of a different, um, I appreciate the response. I think it's a little bit of a different response than um, the question that I'm I'm asking. The Office of Management and Budget has a put, you can see it on the web, they've budgeted $194 million for this reach. And they're required to because they didn't um, complete the south side, they spent all the money on the north side. So the Army Corps of Engineers is saying, this project has to get done and the city's responsible for it. In um, 2021, the Public Building Commission said that they were budgeting, thinking this would be 30 to 50 million, and the Office of Management and Budget just budgeted 194 million for the 45th Street to 51st Street reach. So I'm just curious, like, where do these numbers what is the relationship between this really important um it's it's science and architecture like what's the relationship and what's how does the community uh get information where is that found um um yeah it, like where are the connectors here with all of this yeah i i don't know Juanita, if you wanted to respond to that yeah um I mean, I think these presenters are not on that project, so they right. don't have an ability to answer those questions, but I think these are good questions for us as Chicagoans and advocates to be asking. Um, so I think there you know, need to be other um, discussions, mobilizing activism, you know, activities um, to, and, you know, doing, power analyses and trying to understand who are the, the movers and shakers that we can target to try to get information on those others. So I know there's lots of people on this uh, call who are paying a good attention or, and are the eyes on the ground and on the lake, um, all up and down the lake shore. So we thank you for that. And so let's yeah. be in touch about those things and figure out, you know, how, how we can, you know, be shining adequate light on these things. But we do want to connect, you know, the points where we can, right? And so part of the point of today was to understand the science that's available, right? Mm -hmm. And the modeling that's available to think about how to have, you know, the the healthiest, most resilient lakefront possible. And, you know, we are really, um, as friends of the parks, you know, seeking to promote nature-based solutions. 
and where we can avoid big concrete revetments. Yes. Be getting natural areas. You know mm -hmm. what? What is? What does that mean? Speaking of that, I'm going to push to. There's a couple of questions about trees, and I will say that we've had some conversations with the park district about trees not living well along our lakefront, right? That they don't seem to have a long life. Is there anything that you can say, Jennifer or Rory, about that? I don't know if that's, you know, part of it, but since you're looking at new landscapes that include trees, what are the considerations there? Yeah, I can kind of address that at a high level. I know that trees are definitely a sensitive topic that we've been looking at and evaluating as part of our study. I mean, kind of more broadly, the lakefront is a pretty harsh environment for trees. It's really, they're really exposed to wind, um, you know, salt spray. It's not necessarily the most uh, inviting uh, place for trees to thrive and survive. That being said, we are working extremely closely with the park district on how we could um, better that environment for trees and really provide more of a diversified species of trees along the lakefront as part of this project. Again, those are all part of conversations to come, exactly what types of tree species and size and number and all of those types of things, ornamental, shade, considering all of those when we get into more detailed design. I hope that kind of answers the question at least. It's on the radar. Can you share just, and this is kind of building on what Juanita was asking, some very, I, first of all, thank you for sharing the example. Um, Cause like, okay, where, where have we seen this in action? You know, a few of your favorite nature-based solutions, even if, you know, they don't apply to Oak Street for stabilizing shorelines. Um, Cause there are some folks, you know, asking, you know, what does this mean for ecologies? So, um, after after this presentation, when we're gathering up our story and our information, because that's what this is about, the power that is in this room right now, you know, so many experts right here are helping us tell the story or helping us ask the right questions. Um, so what should we know? Just a few of your favorite nature-based solutions. Rory, you want to take that one? <laughs> um, I'm trying to think through it. So there's... There's all kinds of stuff about engineering with nature that I guess the Army Corps puts together that are good project examples around the Great Lakes. Um, so in terms of my favorites, uh, give me a minute to think about that. But, uh, you know, there's a lot of natural shorelines and stuff like that that uh, I like to look to for precedence. Um, oh, Lake Michigan, or uh, sorry, Lake Superior, I, I like north of Duluth along that stretch of shoreline. I think there's a lot of really neat stuff. Um, the Pitchard Rocks hiking trail. I think that's, I try to look to a lot of places that are naturalized already and try to look at what works. How do you, how do you bring that back into a built environment? And ultimately, I guess every site is unique and that you've got to look at all the various constraints that you're working with and try to work with those and make sure that your design is functional. Um, because a lot of times, uh, like, like Jen said, trees in the harsh environment along the coastline, you can put something really nice out there, but if it's going to get trashed and trashed every year, it's not going to make it. So it's about smart design too, I guess, in that sense, or resilient. <clears throat> but let me think about that. Maybe I'll drop a couple of names of places in the chat before we close up. <laughs> you know, for me, for me, and again, I don't know the technical side of all of this. I'm still learning. But I love doing grasses, you know, and I love the, you know, the the swaying wildflowers where and that's part of the education that we need to do so that um, folks understand, you know, that those aren't weeds, you know, those are part of stabilizing our shoreline. Um, so I'm sure we all have different visions of, of what the softer edge of our lakefront can look like. Um, I want to also note the time. Again, we will stick around for a little longer. Um, I recognize that our, some of our presenters, you know, might have to step away. This is an ongoing conversation. We're saving the chat. 
Um, so anyone else want to speak to some of the questions, like a question that you have raised? Unless Juanita, there's something else that you wanted to put in in terms of the, the shape of the rest of the of our conversation. Oh, I do have to step off at 145, so I will let you all keep going. Yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, questions or anybody feel like sharing, you know, your ideas, let's kind of see how this goes organically. And then we will wrap this, you know, eventually, but, um, you know, definitely no longer than two o'clock, I'd say. Um, so yes, yeah, I'm just going to, let's do it. Let's just, you know, go ahead, speak up. And also, pardon me, like now I'm talking over you again. And also, you know, Jennifer um, and Rory, if to the extent that you can stick around, I know you've been also looking at the chat. So feel free to pop in as well in terms of giving an answer. Is that, is that Paul? Mm -hmm. I, Paul. Hi, Paul Boyd. I used to be chair of the uh, last four miles initiative for a number of years and still in my own mind, very interested in that. I can't help but think that the engineering presentation was very inspiring, very technical. I even remembered years ago going to the same research facility in Canada, reviewing various plans that we had and that Loyola University had. And, it, you know, I, I commend the planning. And in a world where all money is available, uh, of course, I would rejoice in that being built. But I have to ask the equity question, which has to do with the whole lakefront, the whole city all the communities and of course the two miles to the south and the two miles to the north at the ends of the city that whenever we have discussions of you know what could we have something a little better than just piles of rocks uh we get well there just isn't any money well i noodled around and asked questions of some of the engineers on this project and of course no one would answer me directly but i did get answers indirectly that we're talking about a $3 billion project, two thirds of which takes place between LaSalle Street and the river. That means 2 billion available for the Gold Coast and the already well-developed sections of the city. The question becomes if we can talk about a billion or two and some portion of that is the parks, um, maybe half of that, but we can't talk about 40 million here or 40 million there in other sectors of the lakefront. I have to raise the equity question. And I think that's one of the roles that Friends of the Parks needs to raise. That if there is an infinite budget, of course, hey, this would be lovely and do something similar further north and further south at the US steel site and developing the beaches down there, et cetera. But I, I just pointed out that question has to be part of the dialogue. And and Paul, you know, thank you for sort of acknowledging all the different roles that that we play. You know, so us as the advocates, you know, we can ask those those hard questions and and push the agencies that are involved um, with making these decisions about our public spaces. Um, so other thoughts and oh, go ahead, Juanita. I'm sorry. So that said, I think another one of the roles that Friends of the Parks plays is helping people do power analyses and understanding the distinctions between different pots of money where we may be able to get things funded. And so there may be times when something is going to go forward because it is taking money from a transportation pot of money and something else is going forward become is coming from an environment pot of money and so uh, our analysis though is certainly you know always talking about equity which also requires the people who are most involved in the issue to be at the table to be part of what's being asked for um, not just being part of it but to very much um, center um, the solutions we're seeking um, but it's also to be thoughtful about, you know, can this pot of money be put here? Um, you know, and I personally come from a, a housing background where I've listened to people in my community fight all the time about, well, why aren't we doing this instead of that? And like, well, those things are not interchangeable um, in terms of the pots of money 
that they come from, right? In this particular case, we are we have entered into a moment where there's also this new infrastructure bill um, that will hopefully, you know, create a lot more money than there was when we were talking about this project and last four miles, even just, you know, three years ago or five years ago. Um, so certainly equity is very high on the radar and also, you know, very much needs to be defined by the communities that are affected. And they're also, you know, folks and don't want our last four miles initiative either, right? And so we we have to sort our way through all of those things um, in, in the vein of what this equity means as we ask these questions. So with that said, I do have to go to a meeting uh, to prep for a conversation we're going to be having with the new 10th Ward Alderman, speaking of engaging the community around our last four miles initiative. So I'm gonna step out to do that and, and let you all wrap up when you can. Thanks so Thank much. You. And like, so we'll keep this open for 15 more minutes, but I do wanna take again this opportunity to, you know, no offense will be taken to our presenters. You know, you have already given us a lot of time. If you do need to step off, um, we will also follow up with questions. I'm not kicking you off, but I just wanna make sure that you feel comfortable ducking away if you need to do that. Um, one, if you do have one more minute though, I'm gonna go to, so there's a lot of questions about the ecology and habitat um, and I hope we can get to that, but perhaps a, a more kind of cut and dry question right now is just like, can you speak to the to maintenance? You know, what does, you know, like right now, right? It's like, oh, we've lost the sand and how do you bring the sand back in? And how how do these nature-based solutions, you know, working with nature, does that help maintain, does it help to maintain these amenities and assets? So can you speak to that a little bit? Jen, you want me to jump in, Jen? Um, <clears throat> with respect to the, uh, I guess, maintenance in the shoreline realm, particularly sand, I think is what you're referring to and just how, you know, what are we getting, what's going to happen during a period of high lake levels? Is it going to be depleted? Um, so I had mentioned earlier that we haven't gone into detailed sediment transport modeling and analysis. It's been primarily about overtopping. Um, so that is a next step. So starting to look at how these reef structures lay out, modeling that, looking at how you can make it such that it's retained sand uh, and works to effectively minimize loss of sand during extreme events and whatnot. Um, that being said, there's up and down the shoreline, the whole environment is somewhat sediment, uh, sediment starved in the sense that there's been so much development. You have cutoffs, the natural flow of sedimentation coming down the shoreline has been disrupted. So effectively, it's an extremely important topic once you start to build new beaches in an area like this at the southern end of the lake. So that, that being said, I just want to say that it's, you know, it's a, it's not something that we're totally disregarding and focusing on overtopping. It's just something that we haven't really gotten into the details of yet. I like the phrase sediment starved, because um, that's something else we're trying to do is, you know, how what are the phrases and, and the concepts that we can use that are, you know, simple and can like really grab people's uh, attention and imagination. Uh, so anyone else want to speak up um, and advocate for your question? Looking through the questions, and feel free. Um, I I had a question about whether um, I know that this is sort of very much a downtown area and beaches are very popular and things like that. But I think this also speaks just what Juanita was asking earlier: is were were dune habitats or wetlands part of the consideration? Or is that just not appropriate for this site? Because wetlands certainly absorb an enormous amount of wave action and flooding. And that's, you know, when you mentioned drainage swales, but in the renderings, I saw pretty grass parkland with trees. So I didn't see wetland structures necessarily. Yeah, I can I can take that one. So um yes, I, I think in large part the idea is with all of the added park space that we have the opportunity, um, it, it's really given to us in large part because of the shoreline protection measure needs for Lakeshore Drive. That's kind of where a lot of the added park space is coming from for the project. And what we've been doing as a project team is looking at what are the opportunities 
to enhance habitats or you know the environment within those spaces and i think we're very early in that planning process but it is something that we're considering i know um you know wetlands have been talked about bioswales have been talked about what kind of other you know drainage opportunities or needs are are there and then um, two, with the uh, threatened and endangered species, I see that as part of a question in the chat. It's something that we're also taking into account. I know on Rory's side, we've talked a little bit about aquatic habitat opportunities from the shoreline protection measures. So uh, again, those things are all at this point on the table and part of the conversation. There's a lot of detail still to be put to those. So I don't want to paint those renderings as final. I think they're more aspirational and you know, what could this be, as opposed to this is exactly what the lakefront may look like when the project is built. So, Rory, did you want to add anything to that on the aquatic side? Sure. Um, you know, I might just add some stuff from, with respect to experience and building wetlands and whatnot in the Great Lakes. Um, a lot of times, well, this shoreline in particular, if you look at the, the lake bed elevations, it, it, becomes it's not extremely deep but if you go offshore not that far you're all of a sudden in 20 feet of water so to think about the amount of fill that you need and the amount of lake bed coverage that you're going to have to try to create a wetland along here to provide adequate protection for a north lake shore drive it's just it's a huge undertaking and the kind of places that are doing this kind of stuff are places that ultimately have sediment to deal with and they need to find a place to go with it um so a lot of different areas like in Sandusky and Ohio and stuff like that. They're using these kind of solutions to um, effectively store sediment that's a problem somewhere else. And so that's I just want to mention that because it's, you know, you each site is unique where you want to throw around ideas like this and think about how you can do a greener solution along a shoreline. But there's also a lot of things you have to be realistic about. Like if you, you know what I mean, if you do something really green, but it lasts five years because it wasn't the right application for the environment, then did you do good? I, you know, that's the kind of stuff that we weigh when thinking about sort of that green versus gray infrastructure with these kind of environments. Thank you. That really answers my question. Thank you both. And I kind of, I just want to amplify that, you know, when I, again, what are our, what are some of our essential takeaways and questions here? And I think I hear folks saying, you know, okay, we have our, you know, human uses and amenities, you know, the beach and able to train for the triathlon and, you know, vistas and then our habitats, you know, how do we serve our, you know, the flora and the fauna? And then also what are the most effective and perhaps even cost effective nature-based solutions, maybe at different points of the lakefront that, you know, how do we balance those different uses? And so that's one of the takeaways I'm, I'm um, taking away from, from the questions in this conversation. Um, I'm, I do have a closing sort of question, a very small activity, um, like, don't worry, very small activity. Um, but anyone else want to uh, amplify a question that you put in the chat before we start wrapping up? All right, again, not your only opportunity to bring these issues up. This is our work at Friends of the Park and so many of you, you know, the work that you do. Okay, so this is what I'm gonna ask you guys to do. This is one of my favorite little um, Zoom activities. Um, I'm gonna ask you to contribute something to the chat, but I don't want you to hit enter until I tell you. So that way, we all put out, you know, we can see all of our ideas at once um, instead of, you know, oh, so-and-so wrote this and that. So this is what I invite us to do. Two hopes that you have for the work that, you know, for what our lakefront might look like, you know, let's say in 10 years. Okay. Two hopes that you have, or dreams or visions. Put those down in the chat, but don't hit enter until I tell you to. And don't worry, if you don't feel like doing this, this is not a, you know, this is not a gotcha. You're not, I'm not going around and saying, oh, so-and-so didn't put their, their answer that's up. Uh, two hopes that you have for our lakefront. And then I'll tell you when to hit enter.
Jane, to your previous question about inspiration and her precedents and inspiring places, uh, Copenhagen, I think they do a lot of cool stuff with their water. We'll, we'll be putting that on our website. All right, I'm going to give you guys about 30 more seconds. One of the hardest things as a teacher is um, to give that wait time. So practice that. It's very hard. All right, shall we do it? That might not have been 30 seconds, but let's do it. Okay, on the count of three, hit enter. One, two, three. Awesome. Nice. So I had to plug in uh, one of my big issues as a bicyclist and a transportation planner. I always think about access to the lakefront, not just what happens along the lakefront. So that's my plug for um, another way of thinking about, but that is not the point of this conversation. Um, but yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much um, to our presenters, especially for sticking around, um, to the, the expertise and the energy um, and the commitment to the folks in this room. We will be following up with you. Um, we are excited about the opportunities um, and, and we're, ready to, we're ready to be influencers. So here's to soft edges and nature-based solutions and access and creativity. Um, so yeah, I will keep it open just for a few seconds because I don't want to just cut everybody off, but um, this concludes at least my portion of our next lecture. So thank you everyone. Yeah, I just wanted to say thank you from the North to Sabo Lakeshore Drive team. It was really great to be able to present here. Rory, I don't know, so you're unmuted. Yeah, thank you so much. I was going to say the same thing. Appreciate it. Really, really appreciate it. Yeah, and Dave Miller from CDI here. Thank you so much for the opportunity today. And Jen would love to talk more about access to and along yeah, the lakefront. <laughs> yeah, you know, um, and you know, the work you guys do is very hard. It was very hard. I know. And we Excellent. need you as advocates and, and representatives here to make sure we get this project right. And we're here to listen. So thanks for the venue here today to do that. Yes, thank you so much, everybody. Have a great afternoon. All right, you'll be hearing from me. Thank you, have a good one. Thanks for being here, Lauren. Good to see you. Mike, thank you. Um, great job. All right, Great good. job, Jim. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Very inspired. Um, mm -hmm. Paul, again, thank you for being here. We appreciate it. And with that, I'm going to say goodbye and good afternoon.